The physical abuse that he referred to uh, regarding his father would come and the physical abuse. The physical abuse that. Were you uh, saying a goose? <laughs> it's on my fucking brain, mate. <laughs> physical a goose. <laughs> Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. Uh, it is off-season, but no, you can't get rid of us. We are going to still be doing content during our off-season, but we're going to be doing Minnesota rather than the full whack episode. So we're having a bit of time off, but we're still producing content for you guys because we, we don't like leaving you in the dark and in the lurch. So we thought we'd stick around for you. Ben. Mm-hmm. Hello. Hello. Light jacket. Thank you so much. I like your cardi. Thank you so much. Egyptian. Yep. Ferocious. Yep. But actually, this is one of the few that I think I'd actually wear out and about. Not the kind of person that would be doing a pyramid scheme. How are you, Dan? Very good. Do you like my jumper? I love your jumper. Oh, gosh. Where did you get that? Wow, wow, wow. wow. Oh, ICMAP.store. Wow. Beautiful. Check it out. Amazing, amazing. But I know some people like watching us, Ben, with having a bit of food, a bit of, yeah. bit of, a bit of scrand. Probably not recon- uh, recommendable for this episode. This week's episode is one of the few that I would say would not go down well alongside a small meal or a big meal any kind of meal so probably Dharma Picton Catherine Knight Catherine Knight yeah a lot of them are quite gruesome so I yeah. I, per, I personally like watching eating challenges when I have my food don't know why yeah crime and grizzliness <laughs> not while I'm having my dinner uh, but Ben what is today's case this one is a very interesting case Tom this is the case of Joe Maffini the man who made human burgers Yes. Immediately it paints a picture in your head. Yeah. Um, I know we did an Insta post about this guy a long time ago. We did. And ever since then I've been like, oh, I want to know more uh, about that. Yeah, he looks like the kind of guy that would make burgers out of people. He looks like he'd make a very tasty burger. I would trust his uh, his judgment. Um, okay, well, I mean... You know, they say never trust a skinny chef or a skinny baker. Never trust them. You always try to make it about bakers. Never trust a skinny chef is what I've heard. Some people have said never trust a skinny chef. Yeah, and, you said and, it four times already. <laughs> and Joe Maffini, wow, whatever the elements of this case were, he's a very striking figure regardless. He would stand out even in a lineup of all the other cases we've covered. He's just, yeah, he's got a very distinctive look about him, Tom. And together with the fact that he's infamous for allegedly making human burgers or human beef sandwiches. Why beef? Because that's... I'll get on to talk about it, won't I? Human beef. Well, I'll get on to talk about it, won't I? Yeah, I guess you will. Yeah, I guess I will. I'll be crack on, boy. A very interesting title, a very interesting appearance. Quite excited. Well, I was very excited to learn a bit more about this case, and that's exactly what we're going to do this week. Lovely stuff. All right, then. So let's get straight into it. Let's get cooking. So Joseph Roy Maffini was born in Baltimore, Maryland, on the 2nd of March, 1953. So like many of the cases we've previously covered, Tom, um, a lot of what we're going to go on to discuss comes directly from Joe. And in particular about his early kind of formative years, I have got a second opinion, which is his mother, and they contrast and conflict very heavily. So it's quite an interesting one. I would take his words and his actions with a pinch of salt. Season it, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Was that, was that your joke? Oh, Nick, doesn't it. matter. Just didn't deliver it as a joke. That was deliberate, wasn't it, then? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. It'd be rare if it was deliberate. Rare? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we... So Joe, who was one of the six Maffini children, claims that he and his siblings were heavily neglected and abused during their childhoods, predominantly by his alcoholic father, but also at times by his mother. He claims that the physical abuse came mainly from his father, but that his mother was very much emotionally absent and often neglected her children due to the fact that she worked double shifts six days a week away from the family home. I wouldn't necessarily call that a neglectful mother. I would call that a hard work in trying to make ends meet kind of mother yeah no i completely agree with you as it sounds he's taking it the wrong way yeah Um, Yeah. and that will be a pattern that repeatedly emerges so the physical abuse that joe referred to regarding his father would come to an end when he was six years old and this was a result of joe's father passing away as the result of a car crash it's not completely clear if this incident was linked to his father's dependence on alcohol however the news of the father passing away definitely affected the maffini family however just as soon as the physical abuse stopped Joe claims that the emotional abuse 
started to increase more and more. And after Joe's father passed away, he claimed that he and his siblings were frequently split up and sent to live with other families who were not direct relatives. Mm. Um, so kind of friends of his mother. And again, these are all his claims. His mother would very much dispute this. Joe claims that he felt completely abandoned by both his father dying and his mother always being away at work and claimed that the arrangements she had in place were almost foster-like, direct quote. Yeah, but that, that is. If, if it is him living with different families, but... Again, sounds if even from his account, it doesn't sound like bad parenting to no, me. No, no, no. But he's he's really harboring a lot of resentment towards his mother as a yeah. result of this. He doesn't like the fact that, and again, this is all his words that him and his siblings have been split up. Yeah, but then you expect a family to take six of you in, mm. and as well, it's like the mother. He's saying he's been neglected by his mum, but she not her not being around, and mm. she's gone. Okay, yeah, I'm not seeing him enough. Therefore, I'm not giving enough, as enough enough attention to the, my kids. Let's put them in households where they will get more attention. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, so Joe claims these foster-like arrangements really impacted him uh, to the point that he was not even able to confide in his siblings because they were so rarely together as a family, leading him to believe that nobody ever truly loved him and that he never truly belonged. So that's his side. Mm. Now, in later life, it's really hard to get information on him apart from his own perspective but in later life and in subsequent police interviews Maffini would lie altogether about his mother claiming that she just like his father had passed away not long after he became a teenager this was later disproved when his mother came forward to the police and the general public not long after his eventual arrest so we're going to talk about her a little bit now but the guy can certainly tell a story he's Spin quite a creative yarn. he can that's I've literally got so yeah the guy can spin the yarn just to give you some immediate context on the neglect that joe speaks of his mother stated that she had to work multiple jobs not long after her husband passed away in order to continue to make ends meet and support her six children she said that she would have been far more neglectful if she had left them all home alone which is exactly as your point. And at times she would work 15 hour shifts, which she felt was completely not safe, not, oh, yeah. not responsible to, to do that. She held multiple and varied roles, including as a barmaid, in a food market, as a waitress and as a truck driver. And she said that although the Maffini children would occasionally live with her friends, it was never in separate homes and that the children were never separated as Joe had claimed. She also said that none of the Maffini children ever went without food or clothing and that they all received a good education opportunities, claiming that her son Joe was in fact an above average student who was incredibly intelligent, polite, friendly and sociable with other children, again showing no clear signs of abandonment issues or any kind of depression from a young age. So yeah. she's really not happy at the, the sort of claims that he tried to kind of eventually point fingers at his, his mother. Well, first of all, he said she was dead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a thing when people go on to do, commit heinous crimes, they, they take a look at themselves and, and they try and establish why they've done things. Like, you know, in, ther in therapy, you can be asked a question and people can really look into certain aspects and go, that could have made you feel this way. And, oh, your mum not being there, she's very absent and you felt neglected. And it's like, mm -hmm. he might be self-analysing himself later on and thinking, oh, there's an excuse for my behaviour is, is all these things here. But I'm very much team Mummy Maffini on this yep. one because it sounds like she's done the right thing and she's just hard working. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and Joe, I mean, we'll pop a picture up of him. He's not the type of guy you want to be on the wrong side of, but I'm with you. I'm siding with Mama Maffini there for sure. She would go on to claim that she tried her utmost to give her six children as normal and as happy and stable childhood as she possibly could all by herself. And of Joe's claims that his childhood was uh, neglectful, she responded, he was smart and had a good childhood, just like my other five. If he was neglected, it was his own fault it was a pretty good family home so she's adamant that there were no yeah. sort of telltales there may have been a little bit from the father from the ages of, of, of from birth till the age of six but there's nothing that i can evidence that said the mother was yeah. anything but hard work in trying to make ends meet so we have two very different stories relating to his childhood and the two very different stories relating to what is going on in his life is a theme that will continue. Regardless of that, what we do know for a fact is that at the age of 19, Joe joined the US Army. Him spinning the yarn again, his his uh, recollection of events in the army, this guy's a trooper, this guy's mm. a hero. His mother doesn't quite back this up. So the facts uh, come to a halt shortly after this. Joe claims that he was then shipped off to serve in the Vietnam War in 1973. 
during which time he was involved in many shootouts, many standoffs, many combats, and many strategic sieges, which is quite hard to say. And he also developed, during this particular uh, experience, a dependency on heroin and cocaine, whereas his mother claims that he was stationed in Germany, not far from the American embassy, and saw absolutely no combat. And he actually would go on to develop exactly the same dependency on heroin and cocaine, but through immersing himself in the very left-wing uh, liberal community of, of Germany at the time. So conflicting events there. It doesn't do Joe Maffini any favours that in 1973, the exact year that he uh, enlisted in the army, is the same year that America and Vietnam signed a peace treaty. Early in 1973, the Paris Peace Accords peace agreement basically meant that most of American uh, military that was over in Vietnam and surrounding companies all withdrew. Yeah. So it's highly unlikely he was in Vietnam at that time, but he would use that as an excuse to kind of claim he experienced trauma mm. and was a veteran and this and that. So he'll continue to spin this as he goes on in life. And also, when he was back in America which could probably lines up quite nicely with genuine Vietnam War vets. Anytime people tried to talk to him about his experience in the military, he would get very hostile and just not want to talk about yeah. it. So that kind of did him some favours. His mother said that she had no recollection whatsoever of him ever serving in the Vietnam War and that the circumstances of his service were also reported as unverified in numerous press reports. And as I said, American involvement in Vietnam had generally come to a close yeah. in 1973. So Joe claims that as a result of his experiences in Vietnam, again, if he was there or not, basically left him with post-traumatic stress disorder and significant trauma that he was unable to unable to shake also he returned to america having developed a dependence on heroin and cocaine his mother stated after his return he was just drifting further and further away i think the worst thing that ever happened to him was drugs it's a sad sad story and over the following years he's got a large family that he comes from he began to kind of cut off all contact with his mother and his five siblings slowly starts to isolate himself so two decades go by without any note. One thing that does happen is his appearance dramatically changes. So he obviously develops a drug dependency. He's drinking a lot of alcohol at this point. He's living off fast food mainly, and he triples in size. Joe is now a large framed and heavily overweight six foot one adult male, going by the ironic name of Tiny. Oh. He had spent the majority of the previous 20 years living on the streets of Baltimore, but also staying in various bars and living in a makeshift tent in various rural areas and also on campgrounds. You might think that based on his, his living arrangements, he had limited job opportunities or was just struggling to make ends meet, a bit like his mother back in the day. But actually... He had held down a very successful job. So he was a senior machinery operator and forklift driver for a pallet company in Baltimore. And he also had a wife and a son. So he's, despite all this trauma that he's come back to America with, he's able to start to... He's living two very different lives and he's, he's got a strong family dynamic, but he's also an alcoholic, drug-addicted, larger man that occasionally lives off he's, the streets. He's like a fully functioning addict, essentially. Yeah, 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 he's absolutely. He's fucking driving that fork if he's... Gain that much weight. Yeah, driving the fork hard. Into his mouth. He could barely lift the weight. Despite his uh, outward appearances, he also got married, the pair had a son, and he was also given a trailer for the whole family to live in by the pallet company that he worked oh, wow. for. Yeah, which is generous, I thought. It definitely, yeah. Yeah, and in return for this trailer, all they ask that he do is act as security for the company uh, when the factory shuts at living night. Living on ground. Living on ground, yeah. So it's a nice little arrangement he's got with the pallet company and he had a trailer for his wife and his son. He had many friends and acquaintances. He was very well liked and he was described as a highly intelligent, polite, well-mannered and very well-spoken individual, which again, judging by appearances, if you looked at him, you'd be he, he doesn't look very approachable, mm. but apparently he was absolutely lovely. Referred to as a gentle giant. Apparently he had a cultured palate um, as well. Yeah. His living situation uh, as well, the reason why before he got given the trailer, the reason why he lived off the streets, any guesses? I imagine he's just spending it on heroin. Got it in one. The reason he was living rough for many years is because all of his money would fund his drug habit. So yeah, he would continue once given the trailer. Despite becoming a father and a husband, he would still have a very high dependency on cocaine and heroin. He also developed a particular fondness for a certain uh, spirit 
or a certain drink. Can you get it? wasn't Bovril. It looks like a Jack Daniels drinker. He liked Jack Daniels, he liked Southern Comfort, and he liked any brand of vodka. Okay. So, you're, again, you're smashing these smashing these. Well, you said it's a particular fondness for a certain kind of drink, and then you've just listed five. Yeah. The thing about Joe Maffini is he loved to drink. Yeah, big drink. He was a gentle giant of a man, though this all changed when he had a few drinks. So, very friendly, very well-spoken, mild-mannered. If he'd had a few drinks, he liked to get drunk and he liked to start fights. Due to his size, he felt he was pretty much invincible and that really it would be very rare for anyone even to c contemplate mm. getting in a mixer with him because... He looks like he wouldn't be out of place in the Hells Angels, doesn't he? But yeah, yeah, like the underboss level. Tiny. Sort him out, Tiny. Well, they're from Essex. What was yours? <laughs> Mine was Essex as well. Oh, sorry. I was asking why both of them were for Essex. The, the division. Sort him out, Tiny. You got it, boss. Scrappy dude. So yeah, he felt he was uh, he was invincible. I'm reminded there were so basically there were two guys in in my uh, year at secondary school. They were the two biggest guys in in the whole of our of our year. Mm -hmm. So one was very very tall and bulky. The other one was sort of large and round. But they were the two guys. Anyone, just no one would mess with them, right? And they knew it. They knew they'd never get messed with. But it was bubbling because there was always which one of you is the tough one yeah it's a tough yeah. one and it was always they, they liked each other but because people kept going to them I think people were stirring the pot a little bit saying oh he said this about you, you they said that about you anyway on the last day of school they finally clashed and honestly it was like that fight between Godzilla and the dinosaur thing that's Godzilla as well is that also Godzilla? King Kong and King Kong King Kong and Godzilla yeah <laughs> lockers got knocked across the place oh. a nose was broken and it was the tall buff one that, that won but people like that size, they do feel that, you know, they're invincible. See what happens. That, I don't know why I went off that tangent. But I knew loads of big people at school, so. <laughs> what is that? A little flex. Yeah. I, no, I just so, don't want it. I don't want the actual people that it is. Well, they'll know it's them because they've had a fight in the school and someone broke a nose. They would know it. They're talking oh, about fuck. that. It could be. I know loads. I know loads. Yeah. Right, anyway. So, yeah, pretty interesting set of circumstances. Holding down a steady job, maintaining a, a really positive outward image to society, but he's also occasionally living rough, feeding a drug and alcohol habit. And again, I said he was getting larger and larger, but his visual appearance started to change as well due to the amount of drugs he was taking. So he looked a bit more weathered, was sleeping less, but he was still managing to maintain, you know, being an approachable, polite, friendly, well-mannered guy. And that's why I think the nickname Tiny kind of makes sense. Because you wouldn't sustain a nickname like that if you were horrible. I'm surprised he happily took that nickname. Yeah. He's essentially going, it's funny to call you Tiny because you're really not. And he's just like, it would take some bottle to call him Tiny, I would have thought. Yeah. No, I see what you mean. The fact that he took that name probably says he's pretty chill. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's like you said, unless he's drinking, but yeah. So according to Joe, his wife couldn't cope with him being away from the family for extended periods of time. Now, although the trailer is on the site of the pallet company, he would also do work as like a, a delivery driver for them. So he'd be out in the lorry or the van or the truck for, for very long periods of time. And he came home one day to find that his wife and their son were gone. He claims that she became a drug addict and a sex worker as a result of him not being home as often as he should be, which is a, a drastic claim. And he yeah. does like to bend the truth slightly. Mm. He also claimed that she had formed a relationship with another man who he alleges was a pimp oh. um, and that he, she'd gone and took her son to live with him. Joe claims that the man uh, that she fell for ended up mistreating her and physically abused both his wife and his son, which obviously did not sit well with Joe at all. However, instead of reacting immediately to it, he chose not to react and instead decided to take advantage of the fact that he now had a newly emptied trailer. Right. So, again, even if he's spinning this story from his own narrative, you don't come out looking no. that strong there. So it's here that Joe meets 39-year-old Kathy Ann Magazina, who was a sex worker who had also developed a very heavy drug dependency. This is someone that Joe had shared drinks with regularly, but never kind of engaged with because he had a family in the trailer. And after sharing a few drinks together, Kathy agreed to go back to the now empty trailer with Joe. As soon as the pair began to have sex, Joe overpowered her and eventually strangled her to death. And after killing Kathy, Joe buried her body in a shallow grave on the grounds of the pallet factory that his trailer was on. Risky, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's just the case of, you know, that out of nowhere, he's just randomly killing her. One thing that is mentioned quite a lot by the police and by his mother is that his drug habit 
drastically altered who he was. Yeah, it's not an excuse at all. But that the only escalation here I can see is that he's under the influence. Yeah, okay. and he's not even tried to say I strangled her to death, but it was an accident. Yeah, we were, we were, you know, he's basically overpowered her and decided he was going to kill so he's her. She's buried it under his not far from the trailer, okay. behind the factory, but very, very shallow grave. Mm. It's quite a big grounds, this pallet factory. Obviously, it's got lots of storage and stuff. It's a big factory as well, big warehouse. But there's also quite a lot of grounds associated mm. with it. So, But it's a very shallow grave that he's buried her in. And, and you need to keep that in mind. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, shallow as a... Probably as me. Okay, some self-reflection. After, well, why do you think that is? No, I'm not. I don't think I'm that shallow. Do you think you could improve it if you worked on it a bit? Yeah. Cool. All right. We'll, we'll report back. Yeah. See if Ben changes his ways. Her body would remain in this shallow grave for more than two years. However, after just six months of him burying Kathy, he decided to dig up the corpse, decapitate it, put her head in a box, and then attempt to have intercourse with the rotted, severed head on numerous occasions. Mm, yeah. He's not killed anyone before. I can't see that he's really even harmed anyone before. He's probably got a few fights, you would have thought, from his drinking. Most people don't dare. Yeah, that is, I mean, an escalation killing someone, but then digging the body up, decapitating the head, and trying to have sex with the rotten head. Two mm -hmm. years later. Yeah. Uh, sorry, six months. Six but, months. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ultimately, the body would stay buried for two years. Wow. Yeah, that, yeah, that is horrible. Yeah. So after attempting to have intercourse with the rotted, severed head, which I don't want to keep saying, he would place it back in a box and keep it in his trailer. Mm. So even that, surely the smell after six months decomposed position yeah definitely yeah didn't know this kind of thing was going to be in this so thanks no for, thanks for the heads up sorry guys just a middle of the episode warning this is a bit of a dark one heads up was it cheers so eventually the thoughts of his son going through similar experiences of abandonment that that joe claims he did as a youngster began to completely occupy his mind he couldn't think of anything else and information had also made its way to joe regarding the possible whereabouts of his wife and son who were said to have been sighted by friends in south baltimore so not far away at all joe loaded up his truck and hit the road in an attempt to try and find his wife as well as the pimp that he alleges had abused both her and his son. Mm. In a later confession, Joe said, I found out about six months later that she had moved to the other side of town with some asshole that had her selling her ass for drugs. They got busted for drugs and they took my son away from them for child neglect and child abuse. So basically, the mother's now living with the pimp, the, the child, the son is with social services or in a foster home. Yeah. And he is desperately trying to, to find them both so that his son won't go through the same experiences he claims that he did. So after showing photos of his wife to locals, he obtained some additional information about her potential whereabouts. And as a result, he started to stalk out the Hanover Street Bridge, which is a very iconic, not an iconic part, but visually iconic bridge in south baltimore it's also a known location that drug addicts sex workers and homeless people would use to get their fixes and he had been told that his wife and her new partner again who is allegedly a pimp would frequently go under the bridge together play it once he searched the area uh, numerous times and even spent a couple of nights directly under the bridge but never found them. The reason I keep saying under the bridge as well is underneath the bridge, as well as in the nearby area, there was an area referred to as Tent City, which was basically loads of tents, kind of pitched mattresses, little shacks. There was basically, it was a massive, a vast area where homeless people or drug addicts would form. It's kind of like sk Skid Row, isn't it? Very, very similar to Skid yeah. Row, but it's by a river and under a bridge. It's just... And Skid Row is already quite volatile. I would say this is a lot more volatile than um, than Skid Row. It was known for uh, numerous times for murders to happen down there, for people to go missing down there, for fights to break out, people fighting over drugs and money and, and sex. Not an area you'd want to be. Yeah. And, and if he viewed his, his ex-wife and potentially his son as having been there for a period of time, yeah. he was obviously becoming more and more agitated by this. But despite spending some time down there, he never found them. He never saw them come down. So after experiencing firsthand the living conditions he believes his wife had gone through, Joe basically snaps. Bearing in mind, he's already done this to that cafe magaziner. He's already committed his first mm. murder, but he now snaps to a new 
to no extent. He becomes extremely emotional and extremely agitated, and he decides to get high with two other men that were under the bridge, Randall Brewer and Randy Piker. And it's here that essentially things erupt within Joe. So after getting high with Piker and Brewer, Joe vanishes back to within the tent city. He pulls out an axe from underneath a dirty old mattress and returns to the two men. So if you imagine this scene as well, he's a big bulky guy walking through kind of a smoky tent city at the night time. That's terrifying. Mm. The image of him alone scares me. I'm intimidated by that image, but him wielding an axe through tent city, middle of the night, heading yeah. towards you. Horrific. From this point onwards, Joe claims to have committed five murders in seven hours. Jesus. So Joe could no longer contain his anger. He returns to Piker and Brewer and slams the axe through both of their heads, killing them instantly. Fucking hell. Obviously, they're both partially high at that time as well, so they weren't really aware of what was going on as he approached, but killed them both immediately. Joe dropped his axe by his victims' bodies and headed out from under the bridge. He later found two women and approached them to offer them drugs in exchange for more information about his ex-wife and her possible whereabouts. And when they were unable to recognise her from the photos that he shared and unable to provide any information regarding her potential whereabouts, Joe brutally attacked both of the women, rendering them unconscious before raping them, slicing their throats and dumping both of their bodies into the Patapsco River. So it's alleged that he tried to uh, attach some, uh, some rocks and some stones by the river in order to weigh these two women's bodies down. And whilst he was doing this, Joe realised that everything he had just done was being watched by a nearby fisherman. Apparently this fisherman was sort of sat there staring in complete astonishment as to... Yeah. You know, what he'd just seen. And unbelievably, despite his size, Joe was able to chase the fisherman down, striking him several times in the head and body with a metal pole before throwing his lifeless body into the very same river. Again, these are Joe's words. He then retreated into the night and headed back to his trailer the other side of Baltimore. Yeah, wow. So that's five completely innocent people in terms of they had nothing to do with his wife, nothing mm. to do with his son. He'd never met them before that night. Mm. And he's gone on an absolute rampage again according to his line of events. So Joe's appearance, obviously, is a very large, balding, tattooed man. His appearance obviously made him stand out from a crowd, and the murders of Piker and Brewer were very quickly traced back to him. He was arrested, and the case went to trial. Now, if you remember, he just left the axe next yeah. to the bodies. This is where it gets qu quite interesting. The case goes to trial, and they're unable to convict Joe due to the fact that the axe found at the scene of the crime had actually been taken moments after he killed Brewer and Piker and used to commit another murder by two homeless men. Wow. They were unable to convict Joe due to the fact that the axe found at the scene of the crime had actually been taken by another homeless man, Larry Amos, who ignored the two bodies laying bloodied and battered next to it and used the axe in order to brutally murder another homeless man staying in Tent City, Everett Dowell. So basically they had Larry Amos's DNA on the handle of the axe and the blood of Everett Dow. And DNA wasn't quite as advanced then. Yeah. They had multiple people saying this big bald guy was down here. He killed those two people. We saw it. But half of them were on drugs mm. at the time. And obviously the, the weapon for the murder had been used for another murder. So I mean, you would have thought that they, even back then with DNA, you'd say that that's, there'd be enough blood on it. Yeah. And surely the, the wounds of the two men would tally up with oh, yeah. that's clearly been used I mean by, like you see that if, if, if he said he smashed him in the head with the axe basically yeah, so, so that you're going to know that that was a wound done by an object like an axe it's a big axe so then it's but again they're they're basically pinning all three murders on this um, Larry Amos mm. I suppose as well, uh, Joe Maffini couldn't believe his luck. Yeah. Despite that, they would actually keep uh, Maffini in prison for 18 months whilst trying to get enough evidence to eventually convict him. However, again, they were unable to find enough evidence to convict Joe and he was released after spending over a year and a half awaiting his trial. That would prove to be a very fatal mistake letting yeah. him back on the streets. So after Joe's release, later that same year, on November the 11th, 1996, Maffini lured 23-year-old Kimberly Lynn Spicer from a bar that he frequented back to his trailer. And when there, Joe made advances on Kimberly, who rejected him. His pattern from here on would be he's focusing on addicts, either alcohol or yeah. drugs, luring them back if they're sex workers, getting them back to his trailer, and that's where he then plans his attacks. It's not known if ultimately he wasn't planning to attack them, he just wanted sex. 
he would contend that he just wanted sex and it was sex gone wrong. Yeah. That's to the reason most of these people died. So once he got Kimberly uh, back to his trailer, Joe made advances on her. And Kimberly, despite the fact that they were both under the influence of drugs and alcohol, she very much rejected his advances. Enraged by this, Joe picked up a knife and stabbed her repeatedly until she was dead. He then violated her dead body with an empty beer bottle before placing her body in a shallow grave he had dug in a wooded area not far from his trailer. So he's now got two women's mm. bodies on the site of the pallet factory, not far from his trailer. I don't know if he still has their head in the box in the trailer as well. I imagine by now that's that's probably gone. Two bodies of the men he attacked with the axe were found in mm. Tent City, but the fisherman and the two other women he claims to have killed and thrown into the river, never found, never reported missing. Yeah. So that could very much be he's killed two people and he's got to two and made five. Bizarre. But he was quite smart, so I'd imagine simple math. Yeah, we, we've, we always tend to discuss this when it comes to people admitting to crimes or yeah. whether or not they do it to inflate their own kill count, to inflate their own ego. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it seems curious. The following month, on the 8th of December 1996, Joe lured Rita Kemper to his trailer with the promise of essentially getting her out of the rain and getting a roof over her head, but also the promise of being able to do drugs together. Once there, he attempted to rape Rita. However, she was quickly able to break free and make her way out of the trailer, screaming in an attempt to be heard. Joe chased her, and again, he does a lot of chasing and quick sprinting through his recollection of events. And despite his size, he was able to catch up with her, grab her, beat her, and drag her back to the trailer. He then pulled down her pants in an attempt to rape her, but Rita was able to wriggle free from him and escape via a nearby window. She managed to then report the incident to the local police, and actually quite a grisly quote that she gave them. She said that he wasn't only trying to rape her, he was also going to murder her, and he even said to her, I'm going to kill you and bury you out in the woods with the other girls. Wow. Fortunately, as I said, she was able to struggle free and by the aid of a, a window on the trailer, get away, get away from Joe. Around the very same time, and I can't work out here if this is Joe getting arrogant or Joe getting lazy or, or too comfortable, I don't know what. So Joe actually asked a friend of his to help him move the body of Kimberly Spicer. This is the one that he buried in a wooded area on the, on the grounds of the pallet factory, as Joe felt that it wasn't hidden enough and was technically still within the grounds of the pallet factory. The friend who was kind of completely struck by this this comment and kind of didn't know if he was being serious or not pretended to go along with the plan initially but as soon as the opportunity presented itself immediately went to the police to inform them Maffini was arrested and charged with her murder the very same day and as well as this at the time that he was arrested he was actually on his way back from a Christmas party with the owner of the pallet business apparently they both had Santa hats on leaving this this party I get the kind of Tony Soprano Christmas hat vibe there. The owner of the pallet factory was charged as an accessory after the fact for allegedly assisting in the disposing of evidence but that was all put down to the fact that the pallets were being shifted and moved and he may have actually also moved some body parts unintentionally. Oh right. So it's quite a yeah. difficult one there. Whilst in custody this is where all of the big urban legends about this case come about and I guess the main reason most people have kind of clicked this episode or wanted to know more about this episode, Joe began to confess to multiple other murders and would actually lead police to the shallow grave of his very first victim, Kathy Magazina, where they would recover her partially decapitated corpse and in decapitating her he hadn't actually done a very clean job because most of the skull had been removed however they were still able to identify Kathy due to the fact that her lower jaw was still intact and they could get access to her dental records it was an exact match yeah whilst in custody Maffini made the now infamous claim that every victim he had killed on the grounds of the pallet factory he had also grinded up their remains and made them into burger patties of which he would barbecue up outside the pallet factory and sold to passers-by and factory workers. This has since not been disproven, but there is also no concrete evidence to confirm that he did this. He did grill up burgers on site for workers and he was paid mm. paid a sum of money to do this, but nothing can be proven in terms of was it the victims um, and also based on his track record of telling, yeah. telling his side of events. Did he allege that he ate them as well? Or did he yes. Get, okay. Yeah. So he would claim that initially it was a curiosity from himself. He would try little bits of flesh of mm. his victims. But then he decided, you know what, I can't leave these bodies buried on the grounds of the pallet factory. 
went and dug them up, went and took took parts of their of their um, flesh, which again they can't prove or disprove because of the decomposition mm. over the time. Fry them up, burgers. Wow. It's been proven that he did have a little barbecue stand outside the factory, but what he was serving there cannot be cannot be proven, and that's mm. where this big famous image of him, which is harrowing, uh, comes to play. So he, he said that he would barbecue up multiple human remains outside of the pallet factory, and he would sell burgers to passers-by including children, I don't know why he wanted to make that part clear, as well as the factory workers who, who worked at the, the pallet factory. This has since not been disproven, but there is no concrete evidence to confirm that he did this, and given that most of his life story to date has been heavily embellished by the man himself, it's very hard to believe that it actually happened. Although mm. the fact that people can say, well, he did have a barbecue stand, it's horrific to think if he actually did that. The whole digging up and stuff and moving the bodies and things like that seems very bizarre. And if the thought of doing that to then get the meat to then do that, it's just, yeah, baffling, baffling. Yeah. Again, I think it does feel like he's given himself, uh, you know, a legend a story. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the idea that, I mean, you could argue that the two women he killed under the uh, uh, under the bridge with people uh, working, uh, sex, sex workers moving around different states. And, you know, we know from other cases we've done, it's very, sometimes very hard for people to, report missing people because they didn't know that's the kind of lifestyle they were living but the, the fisherman I feel like that's just one he's thrown in yeah, but that's, that's the but, type of thing you'd see in a film but, no, but that, that's what I mean it's like him that that in itself him saying about not, that happening and that wasn't reported as a missing person Yeah, I think that one you would imagine that would be reported as a missing person and the body's not being found in, in the in the, um, the river Yeah, that's you know we know what water could do to bodies and many bodies have been lost in that kind of depending on the currents and whatnot yeah the fisherman makes me makes me question it and then he does just sound like he's trying to as i said establish himself as a legend yeah for, for, for doing that so he claims that before dismembering them and putting their flesh into tupperware containers that he kept in his trailer he also then decided to open up a small barbecue stand by the side of of the road and would serve unsuspecting customers human flesh and he actually said that after seasoning them there was very little difference between pork and human meat this is a really interesting one as well. So some people believe that Muffini was in fact never married and never had a son and that he just decided to go on a, a killing rampage that particular night in mm. South Baltimore. As so few people, due to the fact that he drifted away from his own family, could actually say, oh yeah, he got married. Surely there's a he record a kid. though. Well, I thought surely there'll be people from the pallet factory that could see mm. a woman and see child. If, see if it was stacked up. But you're sure there's a, there's, there's a record of marriage? That's what I, I figured. But it's there's some people that believe it was he never was married and never had a child. I'm with you on that one. I, I believe he actually, he'd tell him. Police said that Joe Maffini had specifically chosen young white sex workers who were addicted to heroin and cocaine and used their addiction to his advantage in order to lure them to his trailer, which is a common theme that we see in all the murders mm. apart from the two random uh, males. The Baltimore Sun newspaper reported in 1997 that it was not clear how truthful Maffini's claims were about how many people he had killed, although he said that he had killed up to 10 people. So only four have ever been proven. Joe Maffini's attorney said that he was remorseful and that drugs and alcohol had changed his personality and made him more violent, which you can kind of see as his life goes on, but it's absolutely not an excuse. It's just, it, this is one of the most odd escalations. Yeah. From, yeah. Yeah, unless he did, you know, spend a few months in Vietnam uh, before they were all withdrawn and he did experience trauma. There are other cases of, of, of similar instances there, but it just seems like, especially his very first victim, mm. he's got the trailer to himself and he does that. One thing I've noticed with all with most of his victims, Piper, Kemper, they all end with us, Magazina. Yeah, Magazina, Kemper, Piper, Spicer. Yeah, there's a lot of them that all end with hers. The other Brewer. Two. It's a good spot from you. I do rate that. Brewer, hardly know. Oh. Um, Spicer. So Joe Maffini oh, was. No. So Joe Maffini. Temper. <laughs> I hardly know her. <laughs> he needs to watch his temper. So Joe Maffini was tried in 1997 and given a sentence. Magazine. <laughs> I'm online, dude. I'm not buying magazines. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. It's all right. It's all right. So Joe Maffini was tried in 1997 and given a sentence of 50 years for the multiple kidnappings and attempted sexual assault, though he was acquitted of attempting to murder. 
so all of his victims mm. were, he was tried separately separately for each one he was then sentenced to death in 1998 for the murder of Kimberly Spicer and at his sentencing hearing he said that he committed murders because he enjoyed it he got a rush out of it got a high out of it and had no real excuse why other than I like to do it from grill master to kill master exactly exactly in August of 1998 he pleaded guilty to murdering and robbing Magazina prosecutors sought the death penalty in that case as well he received a sentence of life imprisonment in that case for one of the murders he received the death penalty for the rest they pushed for a life sentence rather than a death sentence his death sentence for the uh, the murder of Kimberly Spicer was overturned in the year 2000 and the sentence was reduced to life without parole the rationale for the death penalty being removed was that the murder had been committed in committing a robbery but the evidence indicated that the robbery was not his motivation so he took money from mm. all of his victims but very little money they're all penniless yeah. kind of drug addicts so he somehow managed to avoid the death penalty due to the fact that he put it down as financial gain was his main motive. That's mad, yeah. On August 5th of 2017, Joe Maffini was found dead in his prison cell at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland, at the age of 64. It's claimed that this is of natural causes, with many people believing that he sustained a heart attack, although they've never officially released the cause of death which is quite interesting. Yeah. That is the case of Joe Maffini, the man that made human burgers. Probably going to think of a better title than that. Yeah. Baffling, very interesting case. As I said, it's one that's escalated seemingly out of nowhere and seems to be a person trying to create his own myth. Maffini, you could say. You could say that. I like that a lot. But yeah, no, thank you for that, Ben. It was very, very interesting. And yeah, next week, uh, it's a case, uh, I'll be covering a case which I found I found fascinating for many a year. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys. Don't forget, if you are very hungry for more content, over, we do it on, over on our Patreon, have nearly 70 episodes, Minnesota's on there, very similar format to this. And it's about a quid a week for the additional content. Yep, and they're available in audio and visual uh, uh, format. And we do requests over there as well. And I, I can't believe Joe Maffini's never come up as a yeah, request. But true. since we did that Instagram post, it's, it's been, I've always wanted to know more. Mm. And now that I do, I still don't know what I know and, and what's a lie. Mm. Interesting to know what his last meal would have been. Yeah, what do you reckon? Probably a barbecue food, I would have thought. I could, yeah. It'd be really weird if he had something like salad. Yeah, or porridge. A Waldorf salad. A Waldorf salad. <laughs> I'd like him to have that. But, yeah. he, but who knows? I don't, I don't, yeah. Well, he didn't have it because he died. You could see him liking um, fried fish yeah. as well, like a little bucket of scampi. Yeah, Fr fried fish. A fish fry, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. That, that would make yeah. sense. Any other likes for him? Uh, I mean, big, large, bald man with loads of tattoos. I'm sure there is someone on... What's that show where they go into, like, sellers' shops and sell things and, like, antiques and stuff? Like, Vegas version of it. Oh, porn. Porn stars. Porn stars, yeah. Is there a bald guy with tattoos on that? Uh, no. No. Bald guy that runs it. Uh, Goldberg? Goldberg, yeah, a uh, Steve, Jerry Springer, um, <laughs> just bald, just bald, just men. bald men, yeah, just bald men. That's that's fine. Uh, Prince Albert, the wrestler. There you go. We're struggling, but I hadn't prepared any. But I'm sure there'll be some great ones in. You're there. struggling. Okay. It wasn't much. Oh, okay. And if you want to stay in the loop of what's going on and when we'll be back with uh, series six and all the other cases we're going to be covering in the interim, then why not follow us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, which is both at Could Murder a Pod. We post daily on there. And if you're more of a Facebook uh, fiend which many people are by the way it's really really interesting to see how many yeah. people are facebook fiends kicks but off, um, kicks off. uh you know just put i could murder a podcast in the search bar we'll pop up yes you want to see the gang over there yes you do and it, and if you you know you got a spare minute why not leave us a little review on one of the audio platforms it really does help and we love to see it let us know kind of if there's any cases you particularly want to see during this off, off period it's minnesota like we said so uh, none of the big cases but uh, we'll be interested to see what you guys are are hungry to see absolutely what per, what piques your appetite hmm? exactly exactly and i hope we didn't put you off your food definitely ben like we always say we say this all the time keep doing what you're doing well there's a few things this week there is. unless unless it's uh mm, shallow mm, box in the trail as well That's, um see you later guys all best he was def referred to as a gentle giant apparently he had a cultured palate palate fuck <clears throat> <clears throat>
<clears throat> it's okay. Apparently, he had a cultured palate um, as well. Yeah. 